Hi, my name is Penny and um, today I'm going to read you a story called Rosa. And it was written by Nikki Giovanni and the illustrations are by Brian Collier. And I just would begin by telling you a little about Mrs. Parks. She lived in Montgomery, Alabama. The story takes place in 1955 when there was such a thing as segregation, meaning the separation of whites and blacks uh, in public spaces. Um, white people and black people had to use different drinking fountains. They had to sit in separate places in restaurants. They had to stay in separate hotels. And they also had to ride separately on buses when they use public transportation. And this story is about Rosa Parks, um, Rosa Parks changing that when she went home one day using uh, public transportation. So I will show you the pictures as we go along. This is the first one. This is Mrs. Parks at home with her husband and her mother. Mrs. Parks was having a good day. Mother was getting over a touch of the flu and was up this morning for breakfast at the table. Her husband, Raymond Parks, was one of the best barbers in the county, and he'd been asked to take on extra work at the Air Force Base. And this was the first day of December. And that was always special because you could feel Christmas in the air. Everybody knew that the alterations department at the store would be very, very busy. Mrs. Parks would laugh each year with the other seamstresses and say, oh, those elves in the North Pole, they have nothing on us because the women of Montgomery, both old and young, would come in with their fancy holiday dresses that needed adjustments or their Sunday suits in blouses that needed just a little touch, a flower or some velvet trim to make the ladies feel festive. Rosa Parks was one of the best seamstresses. Her needle and thread flew through the material like gold spinning from Rumpelstiltskin's loom. The other seamstresses would tease Rosa Parks and say that she must be using magic. And Rosa would laugh and she'd say, no, not magic, just concentration. Some days she would even skip lunch to finish on time. And here's a picture of her with her measuring tape around her neck. This Thursday, they had gotten a little bit ahead of their schedule. Why don't you go home, Rosa, said her supervisor. I know your mother is feeling poorly and you might wanna look in on her. The supervisor knew that Rosa would stay until the work was done, but it was only December 1st, no need to push. Rosa really appreciated that. Now she could get home early. And since Raymond, her husband, would be working late, maybe she would surprise him with his favorite meal, meatloaf for dinner. See you in the morning, Rose waved goodbye and headed for the bus stop. She fiddled in her pocket for a dime so that she would not have to wait for change. When she stepped up to drop her fare in, she was smiling in anticipation of the nice dinner that she would make. And as was the evil custom at the time, she then had to get off the bus and go around to the back door and enter the bus from the rear. Rosa saw that the section reserved for blacks was full, but she noticed that the neutral section, the part of the bus where blacks or whites could sit, 
had free seats. The left side of the aisle had two seats and on the right side, there was a man sitting next to the window. Rosa decided to sit next to him. She didn't remember his name, but she did know his face. His son, Jimmy, frequently came to the NAACP Youth Council meetings. So they exchanged pleasantries as the bus pulled away uh, from the curb. And Rosa settled her, her sewing bag and her purse near her knees, trying not to crowd Jimmy's father. Oh, men do take up more space, she was thinking, as she tried to squish her packages together. The bus made several more stops, and two seats opposite her were then filled by blacks. She sat on her side, daydreaming about the good day she'd had and planning that special meal for her husband. <clears throat> Here's a drawing of how crowded the bus was. Not many extra seats. Stand up and give me those seats, the bus driver bellowed. Mrs. Parks looked up in surprise. The two men on the opposite side were rising to move to the crowded black section. Jimmy's father muttered more to himself than anyone else. Oh, I don't feel like trouble today. I'm just going to move. Mrs. Parks stood up to let him go by. And then she looked at James Blake, the bus driver, and sat back down. Picture of Mr. Blake yelling at Rosa Parks. You better make it easy on yourself, yelled Mr. Blake. Why, why do you pick on us, Mrs. Parks asked with that quiet strength of hers. I'm gonna call the police, he threatened. Do what you must, Mrs. Parks quietly replied. She was not frightened. She was not going to give in to that which was wrong. Some of the white people at the front of the bus were saying out loud, she ought to be arrested. Take her off the bus. While some of the black people recognizing the potential for ugliness, just got off the bus. Other people stayed on, talking among themselves. That is a neutral section. She has a right to be there. Mrs. Parks just sat still. As Mrs. Parks sat waiting for the police to come, she thought of all the brave men and women, boys and girls, who had stood tall for civil rights. And she recited in her mind, the 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education decision in which the United States Supreme Court had ruled that separate is not inherently equal. She sighed as she realized that she was tired, not tired just from work, but tired of putting white people first, tired of stepping off sidewalks to let white people pass, tired of eating at separate lunch counters and learning at separate schools. She was tired of colored entrances, colored balconies, colored drinking fountains, and colored textbooks. She was tired of getting somewhere first and being waited on last. Tired of separate and definitely tired of not equal. Joanne Robinson was at the Piggly Wiggly when she first heard about Mrs. Parks' arrest. And by the way, the Piggly Wiggly is a grocery store. When she, she had stopped in to purchase a box of macaroni and cheese. She always served macaroni and cheese when she baked red snapper for dinner. 
A sister member of the Women's Political Council approached her just as she reached the checkout lane. Not Mrs. Parks, Mrs. Robinson exclaimed. She, was, she then looked furtively around. Pass the word that everybody should meet me at my office at 10 o'clock tonight. Mrs. Robinson was also Dr. Robinson, a professor at Alabama State, the college designated for colored people. And she was the newly elected president of the Women's Political Council. She rushed home to put dinner on the table, cleaned up the kitchen, put the kids to bed, and then she kissed her husband goodbye and hurried over to the college. It was dark when they finally gathered there. The 25 women, first of all, held hands in prayer in hopes that they were doing the right thing. After all, they were going to use the stencil maker, the printer, and the paper of Alabama State College without permission. If they were caught, they could all be arrested for trespassing. But they were working to undermine a vicious law. They decided they would stand under the umbrella of courage. Rosa Parks had offered keeping off the reign of fear and self-disgust. The women quickly formed groups to carry out each task. Making stencils was the most difficult because the machine keys had kept sticking and they were very hard to use to make the letters readable. If a mistake was made, then the whole page had to be thrown out. It took a lot of concentration. And here are the ladies at the college making the posters and the flyers for this boycott. The posters read, no riders today. Support Mrs. Parks. Stay off the buses. Walk on Monday. The women made enough posters for almost every citizen in Montgomery. The next morning, as people read these posters, they remembered the joy that they felt when the Supreme Court declared that separate was not equal. They were sure that once the highest court in the land had spoken, they would not be treated so badly, but that was not the case. Soon after the Supreme Court ruling, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy of Money, Mississippi, was viciously lynched. At his funeral, more than 100,000 people mourned with his mother. She left his casket open saying, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. Now, only weeks later, after the killers had been freed, Rosa Parks had taken another courageous stand. The people were ready to stand with her. They came together in a great mass meeting, the Women's Political Council and all the churches. They needed someone to speak for them, to give voice to this injustice. And everyone agreed that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. would be ideal. We will stay off the buses, Dr. King intoned. We will walk until justice rains down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And here's a picture of Dr. King speaking um, to the crowd. And the people 
walked. They walked in the rain. They walked in the hot sun. They walked in the early morning. They walked late at night. They walked at Christmas and they walked at Easter. They walked on the 4th of July and they walked on Labor Day. They walked and walked until it was almost Christmas again. And they still walked. A photo of the crowds of people walking and walking and walking. People from all over the United States began sending shoes and coats and money so that the citizens of Montgomery could walk. Everyone was proud of their nonviolent movement. And the sole force that bound the community together would sustain many marchers for the years of the struggle yet to come. On November the 13th, 1956, almost a year after the arrest of Rosa Parks, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that segregation on the buses, like segregation at schools, was illegal. Segregation was wrong. Rosa Parks said no so that the Supreme Court could remind the nation that the Constitution of the United States makes no provision for second class citizenship. We are all equal under the law and are entitled to its protection. The integrity, the dignity, and the quiet strength of Rosa Parks turned her, her no into a yes for change. And here's a, another drawing of Mrs. Parks. And that is the end of the story. And our heroic and courageous Mrs. Parks. Thank you. And goodbye.